Hello, everybody. Today, we are going to be announcing the winners of the February Art Dare, focusing on mushrooms. And we are also going to be announcing the April Art Dare. If you'd like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. The first artist we're going to look at is Daniel Brothers. And Daniel says that they are fairly new to painting, but older to artistic expression, and says, started with the scale of the piece, slowly built from there. It was small, but awesome. I think about how big a mushroom must feel to an ant. Now, Mia, we can see the ants down here in the lower left-hand corner. What do you think? I love this piece. I think that my favorite part about it is the scale that you mentioned, and it's cool that you were able to see that to fruition from your initial um, idea. And I think it's cool because the ant almost reads to me as a copy of the same ant. So it looks like almost a little animation of this ant marching up to the mushrooms. Um, and yeah, I think it's really successful. And Daniel, I love so much your brushwork because the brushwork is so varied. Like if you look at these really playful green marks, but then these sort of scrubby blue strokes here, and then these more globby orange strokes. I mean, I know you're saying, Daniel, that you're new to painting, but I already think you're off to a great start because brush technique isn't always the easiest thing to get a hold of. And I think you've done very, very well there. By the way, everybody, I just love how everybody supports each other here in the chat. It's just really nice to have that community here for everybody to hold each other up. All right, the next artist is Harold Inks, who says their brains bombarded by a variety of shapes, colors, and sizes. And he got the idea to create a family of mushrooms. Wanted to showcase the typical roles you see amongst families, but in a fun, playful way. What do you think about La Familia de Mushrooms? I think it's great. I think this is a wonderful little character design experiment. And I think that you definitely can sense each little character's personality. My favorite one is the pink one. I think that I like how the stem or stalk, is it a mushroom stalk? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> kind of like wiggles up to the, um, the top of it. And yeah, I think that lots of people can resonate with the characters you portray here. So I think that you did a great job. I love the baby. Like I just <laughs> noticed it, the way it's got this almost umbrella like shape. And Mia, I love all the patterns. Aren't those so fun? Oh, I love it. I love it. And I just noticed the cat and dog too. <laughs> those are so cool. I love it. I, oh I think gosh. that you really went above and beyond with the textures and those little lines coming up from the top. It almost feels like a party, like a surprise party or something. Yeah, I mean, these lines up here at the top, they are not the mushrooms, but they definitely contribute to the playfulness of the scene. I really like the change of the font because you have the cursive in the beginning and then mushrooms is more upright. So it's a very dynamic character lineup, Harold. And I, I don't know where it's going. It seems like me. Maybe you need because I think this is really fun. Michelle says, I love the one in the orange dress. She looks so crochet-y, it makes me smile. Manette says, I love the grandpa on the far left. They are all so cute. And Stacy also says, so whimsical. Next artist is Robin Warren. And Robin explains that they used watercolors and colored pencils, added the smaller mushrooms with more natural coloring after looking at the reference photos. Well, let's see what Robin did. We've got this initial piece and we can see some of the progress. I believe this is, is that a second piece? Yeah, that probably is another piece. But isn't this fun, Mia, to see Robin going through these different variations with the mushrooms? Oh, I love it. And I think that the process that they're describing of going into it with line and then color and then without any line and just color, it's an interesting change because I find my style and how it is reading really changes whether or not I'm using line or color. And I think that all of your work is so dynamic. And I think that the lineless one is my favorite because look at that little 
um, mushroom on the right there. Like that's just a perfect mushroom that I want to bite into. So I think that you really um, nailed the form and the feeling of weight in these mushrooms, not to mention the very um, expression uh, like of the frog, which is just yeah. lovely. And it just makes the piece, I think. But I think you did a great job. Robin, I feel like the mushrooms look so plump. Like, don't you feel like you could just squish them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> a really nice <laughs> physicality to them, which is really cool. And it's nice to see the lead up from the initial pen sketch. I love the shading on the stem and then working the watercolor in to integrate. And this one is just so lovely. I mean, some of my favorite parts, do you see where the grass is going over the mushroom? I mean, isn't that just beautiful, transparent paint? It's lovely. I also noticed that um, from your first drawing to this one, the frog slowly starts smiling. <laughs> and then in this piece, the frog is happy. So I think that's like a little sub subliminal subconscious choice that you're making. Maybe this is your favorite. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I didn't even notice that. That is so cool. By the way, Sentient, I did see this article and I was like, hmm, they're ripping off our art there. <laughs> it was an article in the New York Times about how mushrooms are becoming a big home decor trend. So yes, I think we are definitely playing our own part. <laughs> All right, the next artist is Siki Lee. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. And so Siki was explaining they saw the Flickr reference photos and that the mushrooms really resembled coral reefs. So Siki did a school of fish around the mushrooms to make an undersea world fantasy with bright fluorescent colors on the mushrooms. Oh, by the way, everybody, Robin is here live with us in the chat. Welcome, Robin. It was so nice to see your work. Let's look at Siki's. So here we've got orange oyster mushrooms and there's the coral leaf reference. What do you think, Mia? Well, it's crazy because I know that the prompt was mushrooms, but if I just saw this piece, I would say, yep, that's coral, checks out, there's fish. So it's crazy how you made that connection and merged the two, because I think this is a very unique underwater scene. And I love it when people take um, different aspects of nature and put it somewhere it's not really supposed to be. Um, and it ends up fitting. So this is really great. And not to mention the colors, especially my favorite part is that minty highlight on some of the um, tops of the coral. I love it. It really conveys an underwater sense of light or something you'd find in an aquarium. So it's just a really exciting piece overall. Yeah. I mean, Ginger saying the way the fish interacts with the mushrooms is so good. Sam Angelic is noticing the complementary colors. Lulu says, I like the colors. They complement each other. And Michelle says, look at the blue fish just pop off the mushrooms. That's gorgeous. Yeah. I feel like Siki really captured the glow that you tend to see in underwater scenes, but also the texture is so good in the mushroom gills, but also the tops of the mushrooms look sort of rubbery. And then I like the bottom of the piece a lot too, Mia. Oh yeah, it's almost fading out into abstraction at that point, which is so cool because the, the longer I stare at the reference photos of mushrooms, the weirder and uh, more varied and alien they seem to me. So I think that you captured that in this piece so beautifully. All right, the next artist is Lulu, who, by the way, I think is here live with us in the chat. So Lulu, if you want to say hello, that would be awesome. So Lulu says, when I think of mushroom, I think earthy. So I wanted to really capture that with soft pastels. And Lulu says they challenge themselves not to use any black and to fill the entire paper. Well, what do you think, Mia? I love this. It looks rustic. It reminds me of... Um things that I would find nature hunting in my grandma's backyard. It's just very nostalgic somehow. And I think that you captured the nostalgia so beautifully by carving out this white space for the mushroom to fit. It's almost like something is missing or the mushroom itself is missing. And I know that's just me putting a concept on it, but it's really amazing that your piece can inspire that within me. So I just love it. I think my favorite part is the blue and green interaction. It's really lovely. 
So Lulu is here live with us in the chat. I'm so happy that you're here, Lulu. And I like this piece a lot, Mia, because I think a lot of us, me, <laughs> definitely associate mushrooms with, oh, they're so cute. They're so round. And, and I don't know, this mushroom is like haunting me. I don't know. <laughs> it's not what you anticipate with a mushroom. Oh, I agree. Yeah, it's almost like a reminder of something. Like, what am I forgetting? I don't know why this piece makes me feel that way, but I love it. Pat says, love the texture at the bottom where the stalk meets the ground. Yeah, well, I've been mushroom hunting before. Some of you may have seen the video where I forage and then I paint. And oftentimes when you pick a mushroom, it's just packed with stuff around it and it's random things like they don't grow in just like a pretty patch of grass there's just stuff everywhere and i feel like lulu really captured how naturalistic that is because i don't know we've seen so many cartoon mushrooms that <laughs> i think a lot of us don't realize how like yucky it is when you pick them up it's fun though seven angelic says phantom mushroom nice and 10,000 Crows says, love the color scheme. And Lisa says, some stiff competition this month. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of entries. People really enjoyed this. All right, next artist is Stacy Dowdy, who says, graduated from their local community college at the age of 49. That's amazing. I love that. And so Stacy oftentimes uses colored pencil, but also exploring other tools outside of their comfort zone. And wow, we have a lot of pieces here from Stacy and a number of different media. There's Procreate, Colored Pencil, India Ink, Chalk Pastels, Charcoal Drawing. So let's take a look at what Stacy did. So we have this piece and we also have this one, which is like really, really close up. We have this basket of mushrooms. We have these two little characters, this digital piece and a cutout collage piece that you can see here from the side. So what do you think, Mia? Oh man, when I saw those first two pieces, I started screaming. Basically, <laughs> I love them so much. It's such an inch, not even, it's it's compelling. I really get into these pieces, especially um, this one. It's incredible. I forgot what material this is. I think it might be colored pencil. Indian. But it, Oh, wow. It looks like um, something textile. It looks like fabric or embroidery. And I think that by zooming in so far, that's something that we haven't really seen yet. And I really loved that very take. And the first piece, too, I thought it was almost like a rug or a blanket or something that I really want in my apartment. <laughs> so if you make this into <laughs> a rug, please send it to me. <laughs> Well, it's really fun, Stacey, because this one is almost abstract, the way you're focusing on the patterns. And then this one, we really see this collection of mushrooms in a basket. And by the way, everybody, Stacey is here live with us in the chat. I love it when you guys come and we're reviewing your work in the live stream. These are two like little grumpy old men. What do you think? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Or they've had, they're like an old married couple or something. I don't know. Yeah, I get yeah. that vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and then this one's really interesting because the mushrooms are not the most prominent part of the piece. It's actually the figure and the mushrooms are very small. So I like, Stacy that you played with the role of the mushrooms. Are they the main centerpiece? Are they accessories to the landscape? And then what do you think about the collage? I think it's so cool because you really, when I think of mushrooms, I think pop out of the ground. And I think that this almost reads as a pop-up book to me or something like that. And so it's cool that you related those two things and made something very tangible. Um, and that's what I could really attribute to your work is the word tangible. I think that it's something I can feel even if it's just 2D. So I love that about all of your entries. Yeah, Stacy, I love that you included the side view because I wasn't sure when I looked at it how three-dimensional it was. So I really like seeing this view. We can see how sculptural it is. But then for you to layer the two-dimensional drawing of the mushroom on top of that is a great combination of 2D and 3D that I think is really well done. 
Yeah, Sentient says the collage is so creative. A lot of pieces are so tactile in many ways. All right, the next artist is Neil Espinoza, who says this was his way of starting making art again after a long break and used digital media and graphite for the warmups. So Neil had this idea of making fashion sketches for mushroom inspired outfits. And so this was Neil's way of marrying fashion design and character design, but they also symbolize growth and decay at the same time. So let's take a look at some of Neil's initial studies as a warm-up. These are digital. And we also have some graphite studies as well, more digital studies. And now we have the mushroom inspired fashion design. So you can see our reference photos in the upper right-hand corner. And there are several of them here. And wow, I mean, I love Neil that you did fashion design because I've worked with Neil for a little while and I think this is his first push into that direction. What do you think of this lineup, Mia? I mean, it's, I think that you pulled right off of Big Runway. I don't know. I mean, I've seen lots of fashion shows and I think that, um, well, not real life fashion shows, but shows on TV. And I think that all of these designs I could see up on the big screen. And I think that I can't even believe some of these are warm-ups. Like these look like real tangible, amazing pieces. And I think that doing these really informed your um, character and fashion designs. I think my favorite character is the one on the far right. It almost looks like she's being rained on. Um, <sighs> yeah, I love it. It's so beautiful. And I think every single one of these characters has a different mood, um, similar to the family mushroom piece earlier. I think that um, that's really what makes a character design successful is when you can look at it and say, this is what I think this person would be like. And I don't know, you just nailed it. Oh, I just love this take, Neil, because here we see Neil picking up, okay, the shapes and the textures and, and really doing your homework, basically, in terms of references. And then to see it implemented, I mean, I, I just can't believe the sleeves. Like that is so perfect to have that pattern on the sleeves. Neil taking those mushrooms and flipping them upside down, I, I think is so, so smart. Um, oh, Neil is here, accidentally submitted my homework. Oh, well, we love it and it fits in the art chair, so <laughs> I think it's fine. Artist Bab says, these are too cool. I would wear any of these. And Seven Angelic says, maybe even animated characters. And, oh, okay. Neil says the one with the orange outfit. Okay, so this is not for the art dare. Okay, that's fine. These are for the art dare for sure. Yeah, anyway. Um, what a great integration of the colors, the textures, and the forms. And I, I just think it's so great to see this lineup. Isn't that fun? Oh, yeah. All of them are so varied, too. I'm just looking at the um, uh, mushroom beard man and then the blue person. And those, like, how did you come up with both of those in the same lineup? They're so different. And I think that that's so, like, wonderful, wonderful job. I love it. My internet broke up for a sec. Anyway, <laughs> here we go. Um, Neil also did some of these pieces as well, in addition to the fashion pieces. And these are very dreamlike and fantastical. What do you think of these, Mia? Well, it was crazy because I saw the fashion submissions and I was like, that's great. Great job, Neil. Check. And then you just keep making more and more every day. And it's just mind blowing to me because all of these pieces um, coming up are some of my favorites. They're especially this one with um, the face coming out of the face. I think that uh, it just feels like we're morphing into nature. And I like how that brings up the conversation of humanity relating to nature, how we might, how it might torment us, but also we'll always come back to it. And it's just very deep. And I think your color scheme is so rich and the mushrooms are so well articulated. Um, and I just think these are some of the most uh, like put together and well thought out pieces that I've seen. So it's really great. 
they're so luscious. I mean, I feel like this is just, if I put my hand into this illustration, it would just keep going. And so you've created this just wonderful environment, Neil, that feels really, really visceral. Um, so you can see, and, and these do have a very dark tone compared to the fashion designs, which were really fun and really playful. So it's really showing your range, Neil. All right, the next artist is Pat McElroy, who I believe is here live with us in the chat. And so Pat did some printmaking. And I, I guess, Pat, you didn't know this, but you were combining the February and March art dare, which is printmaking. And so Pat explains, used a series of masks and some portobello mushrooms to stamp a texture in the background, tried using fluorescent ink on black, but the black paper I had wasn't ideal for printmaking. So here we have the first version, which is just the carved lines. And then we have this shape of green going on top. And then another version on black paper. What do you think, Mia? I think that all of these um, are just a testament to the lovely block that you carved because even with just the simple line work, that one might be my favorite just because I can appreciate the gorgeous, satisfying marks of the line bringing me through each mushroom. I think it's it's just a lovely scene. It almost reads as a scene, even though it's just a cluster of objects. And I think that's really great um, depiction of a mushroom. And not to mention your thought process for painting the background or printing on black paper. And I, I love your experimentation with this. And you guys, this is really good printmaking technique. I mean, carving lines that are this thin and close together. I mean, you have to have serious patience to do this. So Pat, I'm just blown away by your printmaking techniques. And then the experimentation like Lisa saying, the green was printed with real mushrooms as bio stamps. Oh, I see that now. Okay, well, Pat, you'll have to explain this to us later because <laughs> I'm not entirely sure all the different steps, but that is so phenomenal. And isn't this cool, Mia, because you've got the really thin black lines, but isn't that just so wonderful to have that very bold graphic shape of green? Oh, absolutely. I think that uh, it's kind of the polar opposite where it's just a big mass and then a bunch of little teeny tiny details. And so I think when they come together, it's really beautiful and it has a lovely kind of almost glowing effect, especially with the green color that you chose. Yeah. And I, I think this is a really nice experiment because it basically reverses what we saw, makes the lines the actual um, printed areas. So Really wonderful experimentation, Pat. All right. The last artist is Miles Martin, who says that they needed a series to focus their energy. And mushrooms were always one of their favorite subjects. So perfect for the art there. And Miles explains, mushrooms are so simple, but the subtlety and compl bleh, complexity of form and color provides infinite room to explore. So let's take a look at Miles's watercolor paintings. What do you think, Mia? I think this is gorgeous. I, I love the second one so much. I think that the colors are so true to life and it makes me feel like I'm right in the dirt with them. Um, but also I think that this halo of white and kind of blank space around each of your drawings makes them feel so tender and intimate and soft. And I just really love that approach because it reminds me of um, like a little family or familial love just based on how these mushrooms are interacting. Look at those top two purple ones on the right hand side. They look like they're like hugging or have an arm around yeah. each other. Like there's just such a tender aspect to all of these. Um, and I think that someone described them as ethereal in the chat. And I absolutely agree with that. I think that's so such a good way of describing it. Yeah, I like what Manette says. So soft and delicate. Love all the detail. I mean, Miles, you have beautiful watercolor technique. Um, I love the mushrooms, but look at the grass. The grass is so beautifully done, like these very, very light washes, the more dramatic darks back there, because I feel like a big part of mushrooms is their environment, where you will find them. 
And so when we see them really nestled within all of the grass and all the stuff that's around it is really fun. And oh my gosh, these are so funny to me. They look so like droopy and wet. I don't know. I just love the physicality of these. Absolutely. This one reminds me of kind of a big brother being forced to watch the little brother or take like chaperone him. I don't know why I like am attributing characteristics to these mushrooms, but I think it's a testament to how you're drawing them and how sensitive the scenes are. So I just think you did, you nailed it. So, so good. Yeah. I, I think the, the red is really startling, but then you have the softness of the green to be a really good balance against that. And we even got these here. I mean, the people on the right, they look like they're doing some choreographed dance, which I think is so lovely. And what about this one, Mia? Oh, I love it. I think seeing that gorgeous top of that mushroom and the slight color variation is so beautiful. Um, it, it really, it, uh, it reminds me of how you were describing the mushrooms of looking simple at a glance and then you get into it and there's so many details and variations in the color and texture. And I think in this one specifically, um, you really see that in how you're painting these mushrooms. We have some prizes to give out everybody. Honorable mention goes to Stacy Dowdy. Congratulations, Stacy. And the prize goes to Neil Espinoza. Thank you, everybody, for participating. We had so much fun seeing everybody's entries this month. We have an Art Prof Share today. Art Prof Share is where one of you creates work in reaction to our content. And so the Drawing Basics track is what's featured here today. The tracks are a sequence of video lessons and prompts that you can do at your own pace. So we're gonna show you Jonah Lynn's work. Jonah Lynn finished the track. And Mia, I have to say these drawing tracks, they are so much work. And the fact that people do this by themselves, it just blows my mind. Oh, it's incredible. And if we go back, let's just read Jonah Lynn's artist statement. And so Jonah Lynn says they're a self-taught artist from the Philippines, never had formal art education. And so what they found the most challenging was the wet charcoal drawing brought up my most frustrated self, yet it also helped me to overcome my perfectionist side. And Jonah Lynn had fun doing gesture and figure drawings, texture lesson, challenged their drawing stamina, took five to six hours to finish the piece did it without break so I wouldn't lose my momentum. Well, that's really what the tracks are about, it is increasing your stamina and realizing, oh, wow, I can run a 50-mile marathon, not just a three-mile one. Do you think, Mia? Oh, yeah. And this is really a marathon, like these tracks. I've tried to do them, and I haven't even gotten my foot in the door most of the time because I realize how involved it is. So the fact that you really pushed through and made so much solid work. All of these pieces are so strong and present and they capture my attention. Um, and I think that that's so impressive to do just on your own self-directed. So congratulations. Yeah, and the other thing too that the track gets you to do that I think is sometimes hard without that structure is you just make a ton of work. Why do you think the productivity is so important in the track? I think that um, a lot of people who want to get more experienced with art making or drawing or a specific task, they, they need or crave prompts and assignments and a little bit of direction. And I think that what like through these tracks, you get direction and some somewhere to channel your creative energy. So I think that once you get in a groove, you just start making work so much work and you you get better without even realizing it just because of the turnaround on these pieces and how fast you can make them with a little bit of direction which is such a beautiful thing yeah and i love jonah lynn that you included all your thumbnails you included the setup for some of these pieces I love seeing the works in progress and all the sketching that makes everything happen. So congratulations, Jonah Lynn, because I also think you explored a lot of different techniques. Like the self-portrait is very focused and very clear graphic shapes. The texture piece is, oh my gosh, so rich and so many marks and such a great exploration of tone. But then it's so wonderful to see how loose 
the wet charcoal drawing is and how atmospheric it is. So congratulations, Jonalyn, for finishing the track. And thank you to everybody for all of your support with each other, because that is everything. All right, let's talk about the April Art Dare, which is to create a 2D or 3D artwork with bones. The bones can be human or animal, or you can make them up. Now, Mia, you spent a lot of time in the RISD Nature Lab with bones. Tell us about that. Well, I think it's really fun. I was lucky enough to be around a lot of bones um, pulled from real specimen. Uh, so I tried to take advantage of that as much as I could. And I think it's weird because there's some of the most humane parts like they're inside everyone as a human and yet somehow they feel so alien when you see them up close and personal especially the animal bones like what is that um so i think that it's cool because there's never you never stop exploring and looking deeper into what connects this to what and what makes it work and move and it's it's almost like a little mechanism which is kind of cool I'm always surprised, Mia, that some bones look super thin and delicate, almost like string. But then you've like this. It's like, oh my gosh, dude, what's going on with your teeth? And your jaw is like massive. And so I'm always sort of blown away by the range of forms that they're not all stiff and big looking. Sometimes bones can almost look like thread. They almost have this lyrical quality to them and you know what like humans we have been painting skulls and skeletons forever and ever and ever this is my favorite skull painting it's called the triumph of death it's basically all these skeletons like slitting necks and <laughs> running around and stealing clothing it's just like the most hilarious painting to me and this is the capuchin crypt in rome and if anybody's been here before, tell me in the chat that this just is so crazy. The whole crypt is decorated with bones. Have you seen this before, Mia? I really haven't. I feel like I should have because this is so weird. Like, who would make this? <laughs> I want to know who put this together and why, but I can't look away. Like, what? No. Look at all of the That's so many bones in one place. <laughs> it's... Ter they had like a wall of pelvises like they were all stacked on top of each other it's like really what what got you guys to think this i mean it's an amazing place but geez it's really really morbid <laughs> anna is asking do you mean make art from actual bones or representing bones in an artwork either however you guys want to make bones i mean you you could get clay sculpt bones you could, I don't know, when I went to Southern Utah, there were bones all over the fields and we were just like picking them all up. We came back with all these trash bags of bones. But bones have always been symbolic as well. So Mia, do you want to tell people about these paintings, the Dutch Vanitas paintings? Oh, I think this is a different one, is it? Oh, anyway, th these are the ones that tell you you're going to die. Oh. <laughs> I think I'm seeing some, maybe my screen froze or something, oh, maybe. but, um, okay. oh yeah. I mean, there's so, there's such a sense of, um, morbid curiosity and ominous feelings in any painting of skeletons and bones. And so it's, it's interesting to see different artists portray that theme through different bones and scenes and everything like that. There's really no end to where this prompt can take you. Oh my goodness. W315 says, nature leaves me gifts when I hike. Yeah, it depends on where you are. But um, I do have photos later of, just, it was just like a field and there were bones everywhere because, you know, it's the mountains and whatever. <laughs> There's like wild west of bones. And then we all probably have seen Van Gogh's smoking skeleton, Georgia O'Keeffe's images of animal skulls. And Jenny Holzer did this uh, installation. And I really like seeing this, Mia, because sometimes people think about skeletons as, oh, scary, creepy. And they are. But isn't this so fun? Oh, yeah. I like characterizing everything, as everybody may know already about me. But I think that taking something so creepy and making it 
I mean, this is still kind of creepy, but making it less <laughs> overtly scary is another really interesting take. I mean, my favorite time of the year is when all the Halloween decorations come out and it's like all these bones everywhere. And then I get to comment about how anatomically incorrect they are. Oh, that's <laughs> so, hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And, and so this is an example how you can make things that look like bones, but they're not real necessarily. Because if we look at Giger's piece, he has all kinds of skeletal looking hands. They're not realistic looking. And then there's... Ugh, Damien Hirst. Sorry, not a fan. <laughs> what do you think of this one? Are you a fan or not? I mean, I don't know. I feel like it depends on the day. I feel, I feel like right now I'm kind of like, mm. but I do appreciate all the sparkles. <laughs> so it's encrusted with, I think it's real diamonds. I can't remember how much it is. It's very Damien Hirst, but you guys can look it up. Uh, and actually, this is a series, I did this so long ago. This is from like 2001. And it was actually one of the first series that I did after art school. And these are dry point prints that I printed with the exact same baby press in the dry point tutorial in my crappy little apartment in Boston. And so I just had one skull and I would just twist it and turn it in all different types of directions to create these more surrealistic objects. And this was my entry point into learning how to create a series that was a lot more focused. Bav says, how to deal with my friend that when I pass, she has to gold plate my rib cage and make a bird cage out of it. Gotta get started so she can submit it for the art there. Oh my gosh, wow, that that's certainly a plan. That's badass. Well, we. <laughs> We also have prompts for everybody. So Mia, th this is more if you want to study the anatomy, but um, the skeleton is a great way to study. Oh, absolutely. I think that even if you just take this month's dare and just try and study and learn about anatomy and how everything fits together and how we move and everything like that, if, if it's a more methodical approach or um, studious approach, I think that's beautiful too. I mean, I'm still trying to learn that myself because it's so complicated. <laughs> so there's so much, so many diving in points. And I just realized like the next morning I was like, oh my God, that dog skull is really big. <laughs> Cause I did this on the live stream on Sunday. I'm like, what, what's going on? But that's the thing is that it's not about accuracy when you do these anatomical study drawings. It's just to think about, okay, where do these bones go? So Jordan did this digital one where he built the skeleton first and then he built the dog around it. So this can be a great form of study. We have all kinds of references that you guys can look up. And these are the bones. They were just in the forest. Like, isn't this just super creepy? They were oh, just like so in a scary. meadow. It's so scary. I would go on the train tracks in high school and like walk the train tracks and pick up little deer remnants and things. I was, but I had someone with me, so I wouldn't get run over. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be careful when hunting for bones. Yeah. So these were just, it was just a field and it was just like a field of vertebrae. So we just walked around and we picked up vertebrae for the afternoon. These are some from the Rizzi Nature Lab. These are skull, the skull reference photos that I shot. These I found in Southern Utah as well. It, like, I don't know what these are at all. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's a pelvic something, but I had a lot of fun finding those. And again, if you want to study, maybe this is your opportunity. Or if you want to make a dancing skeleton animation, that's also cool as well. So all of you can decide what direction you want to take it in. And you know, if Michael Fassbender <laughs> helps you with your anatomy study, that's a, <laughs> I haven't watched one of his movies for a while. I think I know what I'm doing tonight. <laughs> okay. Oh, Manette says, I find dead seagulls on the beach all the time. One of these days got to collect them so I can get the bones. I have deer bones macerating in a tub in my yard. Ooh, I mean, I, I love this stuff. This is so my thing. So everybody, you can hang out in the Art Dares channel in the Discord. I know a whole bunch of you 
saw these pieces in progress before today's video. And it's really, really fun to see everybody's work in progress, get ideas from each other. Because really, Mia, isn't it more fun to make art together than alone oh, in a yeah. room? It's so fun, especially when you post something and everyone is excited about it and giving you ideas and everything like that. It's It really feels like a classroom or, or a fun club environment. And that's that's one of my favorite things. Without grades, thank goodness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So the official way to submit, tag us on Instagram, use hashtag artprofdare. But if you don't have Instagram, no problem. We do have a Google form, which you can get on the website. Remember, everybody, we have April workshops with a slide that is not updated. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't update this slide. So the three workshops that are running this April are watercolor interpreting nature, which is the Saturday, jelly plate experiments, and drawing cats. So you can still enroll in one of these three workshops up to two days before the workshop date or when it fills. That's when we close the registration. But I'm having so much fun, everybody, teaching these workshops. So take a look because we work with each other in real time. It's like a cool art party. We just love it. Join our Patreon group. Your pa the, our Patreon group <laughs> has opportunities to share your art in weekly voice sessions with staff. You get critiques and support from me. I critique pretty much every piece that comes into the Patreon channels. And you find support in a small group of artists, which is really nice. I love our server, but it's big. We have 11,000 members now. And you'll find in the Patreon group, it's just a lot easier to connect with people. Somebody sponsor this video. I have an amazing model, okay? I want to shoot reference photos. I want to shoot a video. I want to do it. But I got to run a studio and I got to pay the model. So whoever can step in and help us pay for this would be fantastic because then you're creating content for the community. Art Prof has services. We have artist calls, personal art curriculums, artist statement editing, and portfolio critiques. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. Look at all these people who are helping us keep the lights on. Thank you for your support. Visit artprof.org for content that's not on YouTube. You can use the search bar. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And subscribe to our channel for more art tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Or you're going to have to deal with Maggie. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.